we've been talking a lot about the velocity and velocity versus time curves okay. and other terms that are closely related to velocity. For example, we learned that the absolute value of velocity as a function of time is what speed is, that the signed area of velocity versus time from A to B tells us the change in position, and that the signed area of the speed versus time tells us the total distance traveled. The question is, are there other similar concepts associated with A and the absolute value of A and with X and the absolute value of X? Well, I wouldn't be teaching this segment if there weren't, but we're not going to go into a lot of detail here. I just want to illustrate the fact that in various contexts all of the analogs to signed area of V, absolute value of V, and signed area of absolute value of V also come up for acceleration and for position. Let me just give you a couple of examples. So this is a picture of a spaceship, the Dragon spaceship made by SpaceX. Now, after you've launched a rocket and you've put a spaceship into orbit, there's a need to change the orientation of the spaceship, move it to a lower or a higher orbit, speed it up, slow it down, and so forth. Each of those changes requires that you fire the thrusters, and that's what's illustrated here in this picture. These are the thrusters firing. Now, every time you fire a thruster, you change your velocity. You fire it to increase your velocity, you fire it to decrease your velocity. And so the amount of fuel that you need to store on the ship, the amount of fuel that you expend in changing your velocity doesn't depend on whether the fuel is used to increase your velocity or decrease your velocity. And so in this case, to find the total amount of fuel that you need to store on board the ship, you have to find the signed area under the absolute value of the acceleration curve. And in fact, this has a name, but you certainly don't need to know it. This is just if you're curious. Uh, it's called delta V. And it's a big part of planning space missions is to calculate the delta V, which is effectively the signed area under the acceleration versus time curve for all of your planned orbital maneuvers. Let me just touch on one other example. What about x, x is position as a function of time, what does the absolute value of x represent? Okay, well this is the distance from the origin, right? Position tells you your, whether you're to the right or the left or above or below the origin, but the absolute value of position simply says how far you are from the origin without respect to in which direction you are. And while delta V is something that is probably not going to come up in the rest of a first year calculus course, distance from origin definitely is. We're going to turn now to what is really our final major topic in visual calculus, and that's the concept of maximum and minimum. Now maximum and minimum, which are often just called max and min, those two ideas are a concept that I think you're already pretty much familiar with. It's uh, something we think about a lot in our ordinary course of life. But as with so many of the terms we've covered so far, we have to be a little bit more precise about what me mean. So let me illustrate that with an example. Here I have two heights represented. One, the tallest point above sea level on the earth, and that's Mount Everest at 8850 meters. And then the minimum height above sea level, and that's the Mariana Trench at negative 10,900 meters. So, of course, we would call Mount Everest the maximum height. We'd call the Mariana Trench the minimum height. But notice one thing we didn't do. We didn't talk about the max height and then, let's say, the shortest height. 
because the shortest height would probably be zero, something like that, okay? So when we talk about max and min, let's be sure we remember the negatives. It's not biggest and smallest, it's largest or greatest and least. One other thing, and that is maximum and minimum are called extrema. There's no new math when I use the word extrema. It just means both maximums or maxima and minimums or minima. So with that in mind, let's see if we can't look at a V versus T graph and ask some questions about where the max and min of various quantities are. So hopefully this velocity versus time curve is uh, perhaps a little too familiar to you right at this stage, that you've seen too many of them, but that can be a good thing. And then we have all of these different words that we've tried to be a little more precise about their definition. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about what the greatest acceleration is over the course of this graph, what the least acceleration is, what the greatest velocity is, what the least velocity is what the greatest speed is, and what the least speed is. We'll postpone the position and distance questions while you pause this video and try to calculate the pair of quantities for both acceleration as well as velocity and finally for speed. Okay, my hope is that you finished that and that you got answers something like this. Uh, I'm not going to go over each one in detail, but if you did get these answers, then you should feel confident about your ability to really understand greatest and least in the sense of acceleration, velocity, and speed. Note in particular that the velocity and the speed really do differ when it comes to greatest and least. The greatest velocity is 10 meters per second. It's just the height. The least is negative 30. But the greatest speed, because speed is the absolute value, you'd have to reflect this graph up into here. okay? And then you realize that the largest value is the 30 up here. And the least value is just zero because speed can't get any smaller than zero. We'll next turn our attention to position and distance. But because it involves signed area, that's going to prove a little, I don't want to say trickier, but a little more involved. So we'll start with a clean graph. As I said, I wanted to handle the calculations involving signed area for min and max separate from the ones that we'd already done for slope and height. Because one has to be a little more careful in thinking about them. I've also changed the V versus T curve so that it illustrates a couple of more ideas that I need to emphasize. But our problem is still what I posed at the end of the previous lesson. Namely, we want to be able to calculate when we're farthest to the right, farthest to the left, as well as farthest from origin. Where that last thing, the farthest from origin, Okay. It's really about what might also be called distance and know that this is an this is absolute value of position. So let's start with an observation. Suppose I'm interested in finding farthest to the right. Now right is our positive direction meaning when our velocity is positive we are moving to the right. So farthest to the right I'm at some location initially, and I deliberately haven't specified my initial position here because that's not where I need to focus. But I'm at some location initially, and then what do I do immediately after that? I start adding positive signed area, meaning I am moving farther and farther to the right. So if I'm looking just for when I am farthest to the right, I know no matter where I am, that it does not occur at t equals zero because I'm continuing to add 
signed area as I move up until t equals 3. Now, what happens right at 3? Right at 3, I start adding negative signed area. So one possible place where I could be farthest right would occur at t equals 3. Now, if I'm looking for farthest to the left, a similar argument applies. Wherever I am here, I am farther to the left as I move here because I'm adding negative signed area. Adding negative signed area means I'm moving to the left. So farthest to the left can't occur anywhere between 3 and 6 because I keep moving farther and farther to the left. So the next place to consider is here. Well, what I hope you see is a pattern starting to emerge as we look for extrema, whether min or max. And that is, it occurs when the velocity changes sign. And perhaps the simplest way to locate where velocity is changing sign is to see where the velocity is zero. And so one can immediately identify as candidates all three places where the velocity is zero. And that's a good strategy in general to use, and that's why I'm laying it out in this very simple example. However, there's something very different about this last time where the velocity equals zero compared to the other two times. And that is, here the velocity actually does not change sign. So, at seven, for example, if I were to start there, I'm adding more area, more positive area. And so maybe I'm going farther and farther to the right. So why is it that I don't need to check to see whether at two, t equals 8 I'm farthest to the right? It's because I keep adding positive area after that. I slow down and I speed up, but I never start to go to the left. So I'm going to write that out, what we've just learned. So to look for extrema in a V versus T graph, if you're looking for extrema of position, the simplest way to look is to look for places where V equals zero. But not all of those places will actually count. You can rule out candidates where the velocity doesn't actually change sign. Now, that's not the only place we should look. There's one other place that we need to look. Okay? And perhaps you can guess it before I say it. All right, time's up. Here's the thing. I'm moving to the right, starting here at 6. I continue moving to the right because I keep adding positive signed area. I slow way down, but I don't move to the left, and I keep adding positive signed area. So it may be that I'm farthest to the right at the very end. And that really illustrates the key. Namely, I need to also consider the endpoints. In fact, if you think through the logic, it could be, I'm not saying it's necessarily so for this particular graph, but for an arbitrary graph, it could also be that one is farthest to the right or farthest to the left right when one begins. And so we have to consider both endpoints. So let's add that in. Okay, so again, you can start off simply by looking where v of t is zero. You can refine that by finding where v of t changes sign but you also must include the endpoints. These are what we call our candidates. And at the start of the next video, we'll show how we evaluate our candidates in order to determine the final answer. We've covered quite a bit in this lesson. We learned that in analogy with speed as a function of velocity, speed is the absolute value of velocity, that distance from the origin is the absolute value of position. And that allowed us to turn to our final topic, namely minima and maxima.
They're called extrema, but that doesn't tell us anything new. It's just that finding extrema turns out to be very important in calculus, one of the best things calculus can be used for. We clarified with that example of Mount Everest and the Mariana Trench that least or the minimum does not necessarily mean closest to zero, that we've got to remember negative values. And then finally, <clears throat> when we move to position extrema from the V of T curve, we don't have to consider all the points. Instead, we start out by considering all those places where the velocity is zero, though we have to refine that to places where the velocity as a function of time actually changes sign. And we need to include endpoints as candidates too. Once we've done that, we're in a position to choose from among those candidates to find the actual global extrema.